Welcome to the second half of my lecture on quantum computing. As has been tradition for the course, my background is scenery from my travels around Australia, but this one's probably the exception rather than the rule in the sense that it's not one of my own photographs. It's a landscape painting by Robin Collier. And it's the only footage I can find anywhere of um, a little known thing, which is the crashed TARDIS of Lake Burragarang. Um, which was a myth of my childhood, but I can actually verify that this thing exists because I've seen it with my own eyes. Um, those of you who happen to know where it is will be rather surprised by that for two reasons. One is that uh, walking to the location is illegal because it's inside the exclusion zone for Warragamba Dam, um, which is the water catchment supply for Sydney. But also um, on top of that, it's in a very remote location, so it's probably several days hiked through untracked remote um, escarpment country to even get to that location. Um, now I've actually been up directly above it, and your next natural question may well be something like this. Well, if you were directly above him, how could you see him? Because I was inverted. <coughs> no, he was, man. It was a really great move. He was inverted. Stalls and spins training, it's the most fun you can possibly have at age 17 in any vehicle. Um, and it affords you some opportunities to see some interesting country that you might not otherwise get to. Okay, so let's get on with the lecture. Um, part of the reason why I wanted to bring up the TARDIS today is because I'm going to start the second half of um, this lecture by going back in time. So let me bring up some slides and we'll use my TARDIS to take us back to 1985. Um, so this is me at 1985, uh, would have been 10 years old. Um, these are three of my four sisters. Yes, they actually form a triplet state. There's a Hadamard and uh, a control not involved in that. And um, the interesting part of the picture is not the Lego and not the kids, but hiding up here in the left hand corner. Um, those of you who are sort of um, technology um, history aficionados will spot this thing as a Atari 2600, um, which was one of, I guess, the first home computers that um, kids would have had. And at that stage, it was basically being sold as a games console. But my parents, in the interest of um, me not just spending my entire life playing around, but actually learning to do useful things, bought me a few game cartridges, you know, Space Invaders and Combat and Adventure and stuff like that, and one on basic programming. And so it came not just with a joystick, but also with this rather elementary keypad that plugged into the two um, D-shell ports in the back, clicked together, you put little um, cards into them, and then you had something of an elemental keyboard, and this is sort of the programming interface for this thing. And you can see that you can just basically start to write programs, um, you can see your memory locations, and then you spit out some output, okay? Just to give you some context for the performance of this thing, this is a 8-bit um, MOS CPU running at 1 megahertz, um, and it's got 128 bytes of memory. So one of the nice things about that era is you learn to not write bloatware. Um, you don't actually have much room to move, and so you learn to be computationally efficient very, very quickly. Anyway, one of the big things in my childhood that ended up getting me into computers long term, and that was a really good thing. And the reason why I want to bring that up is because you're all kind of fortunate in that you're in, for at least as far as the quantum computing age is concerned, the time when you're starting to get the quantum equivalent of the Atari 2600. So one of the nice developments of the last decade or so is that a lot of the computer technology companies, you know, IBM, Microsoft, um, all the others have started putting their efforts into building quantum computers. Some of them have got them to work, like IBM. Some of them are still trying, like Microsoft. And um, IBM, having a working quantum computer, actually started to make some of their earlier models available for people to play with on the internet. Um, and so this has been going on for quite a few years now. An interface for doing this has been gradually growing as, uh, over time. So early on, it was a simple web interface where you could basically just assemble gates um, 
um, on a program sequence. So here we've got um, a five bit quantum computer. You can see your one, two, three, four, five bits running down the side. Um, you can gang up a string of operations. So you can see here, I'm doing something really simple, taking a Hadamard gate, adding a controlled knot. So I'm just making an entangled state and then doing measurements. So this pink thing is measurements. Um, and then they drop um, your measured qubits onto a classical line down here, which is where you can read out your output. Okay, so this would just be a simple thing of make an entangled state, now have Alice and Bob um, open their two envelopes and measure um, their states on the inside. And you could actually run this on a real quantum machine and see what the output was. Okay, so here we go, here it is, our entanglement, we create a triplet state, look at the two different states. And so you'll notice down here, this is the five bits for the quantum computer here from um, one through to five. And I've only been using the two bits on the right hand end, so 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. The other three bits are just passengers um, on this particular calculation. I make a entangled state, which will be 0, 0, and 1, 1, and then I do a measurement, and half the time I will get 1, 1, and half the time I will get 0, 0, as you would expect, and you see those two outcomes come out with a little bit of error um, in this. And this is one of the challenges with quantum computation as well, is that you tend to get experiment error in this, and how do you correct for those errors as you go through the programming. And there's a whole subfield of quantum computing, which is basically just quantum error handling. It's a, becoming a nice big field now. So in the past, the easiest way to access this was via something known as the Model Q Quantum Keyboard, which was uh, initially brought out as a little bit of a sort of April Fool's Day joke gimmick sort of thing, but actually had real substance to it. So you could scroll down to the bottom of the page and there was an online version of the Model Q that you could actually do really simple um, quantum computations with, um, just five bits little bit of entanglement away you go that was fully functional a couple of years ago but it's now been removed um and it's all running by jupyter notebooks which is fine because i actually prefer to use the jupyter notebooks version anyway it's a lot more versatile and it's a lot closer to what a real computing environment is going to look like okay so what we're going to do today is what i like to call the most expensive demo ever because i'm basically using um infrastructure worth millions and millions of dollars owned by IBM that they very kindly allow the public to use um, to demonstrate for you quantum mechanics in real action. So what we're going to do is the something similar to the entangled state experiment that I did um, back in lectures in seven and eight, but now with real quantum bits. Okay, to step this one up a little bit, what I'm actually going to do is not do two qubits because it's kind of boring and we've, we've all talked about that before. I'm going to go to the three qubit equivalent of an entangled state, which is something known as the Greenberger Horn Zeilinger state or the GHZ state, which looks a little bit like this. It's basically 0, 0, 0 plus 1, 1, 1. So it's the extreme um, case entanglement um, properly normalized. OK, so this should give outcomes if you measure it of zero 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 so um alice bob and uh whoever's left over let's call him Dwayne, gets uh zero and then if alice gets one then bob and Dwayne are both going to get one as well we should know those should be the outcomes at the end of this experiment so we know what's going to happen but let's try it because and see if the experiment lives up to what we're going to do what we're going to do is um in a minute, I'm going to switch over to running in Jupyter Notebooks with a package called Quisket that you can pull down for free as a Python library from the internet. Um, you then are able to um, get an API key from IBM, and I'll show you where you pull that down um, with a login in a moment. Um, that will get you access to the um, IBM quantum computers, you'll have a certain amount of credit associated with your account in there. So you can't go doing, you know, 27,000 million hours of computation. There's a limit to how much you can do in a period of time. But if you're, a, you know, want to play around, you can do a decent number of calculations pretty easily. And um, it allows you to connect to those computers and then you do your coding inside there. OK, so what we're going to do is our little bit of coding in here is basically have three quantum bits, just so I can explain it before we start. And we're going to build this GHZ state. And the way we build the GHZ state is we take the first bit, we use a Hadamard gate to make a superposition, and then we do a pair of controlled knots. The first controlled knot will um, add on the second qubit to get you the triplet plus state that we talked about just before. And then the second control knot in here 
will um, now combine that entangled state of the first two qubits with the third qubit and get us an entangled state of three qubits in that particular case, okay? And um, it's an interesting exercise. You can go back later for yourself and confirm that um, mathematically that doing this will give you that particular state, okay? You're gonna be up into sort of uh, nine by nine matrices, but um, some of you can handle that computationally um, rather than having to write it down and it should be fairly fast to do. What we're then gonna do, this is just a little barrier in here to separate our two halves of our experiment. What we're saying is we're just gonna create this state and then wait for a while. And then what we're gonna do is go through and do a measurement, right? So we're gonna measure the, measure the three qubits and see what the results are. So we're gonna drop those measurements out to our three classical lines and those classical lines all correspond to a quantum line, okay? Um, so we'll drop those out and we'll look at these outputs here um, because they're our measurable outcomes from the experiment. Okay, so to run this, you're going to want Jupyter Notebooks running on your machine. Um, I run at the moment with Python 3.6 under Anaconda 3. Um, just open Jupyter Notebooks under that. Then what you're going to need to do, and I won't show you how to do it because it takes a while and it's a bit machine specific, you're going to want to add um, a set of libraries to your Anaconda install that's known as Quisket. You can get it at this website here, quisket.org. Um, it's fairly easy to install and there's instructions on how to do it. And um, then you want to do, what you want to do is you want to pop over to quantumcomputing.ibm.com. Um, over there, just to show it, you've got um, fairly comprehensive instructions of how to do a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about today and two possible routes to doing it. So one, they will walk you through how to do it as a local install, install using Kiskit. Um, the other is that um, they have an embedded version of Jupyter Notebooks inside this website that you can use directly um, if you don't feel comfortable setting it up on your own machine um, or you don't want to run it on your own machine. What you'll also want to do is set up your own account um, with IBM Quantum. You can access it just up in the corner. And if I go across to my own account, um, if you have a look in your own account details, which you'll see just up in this block here, account details, um, over on the right hand side, there's use IBM Quantum services with Quisket in a local environment. It gives you um, a link for how to install and instructions. And then down here, there's a little API token that you want to copy and that API token enables you to connect your local um, running of Quisket to your personal account. And it's a way of them keeping track of your usage um, credits on, um, on their quantum machines, okay? So um, let me just switch to um, my running instance of um, Jupyter Notebook. I have one notebook that I keep um saved ready to run when i need to run this thing and it basically only has one instruction in it which is this from kiska import ibmq and then do ibmq save account and then i paste my um, api code in here which you'll see is a very large string overwrite true just to make sure it rewrites itself and um, i will operate that that one um just to make sure that my uh, login is hooked up for um for the IBM quantum machines. Okay, um, then what I wanna do here is just open a new boat notebook, like so, and um, I, can get, I can get busy working on this, okay? So I'm gonna work through this command by command so that if somebody wants to later on follow through, you can do it. But some of the longer commands, um, I might cut and paste from, um, somewhere else just to save us some time. So you're gonna do the um, usual thing in here uh, of importing NumPy, which um, is just one of the library packages that enables you to do numerical um, handling very, very quickly. Um, we're also gonna want um, matplotlib um, so we can do some graphing later on. And we're gonna to want to pull in from Quisket um, a few of the functions for handling quantum circuit design and um, information in this. So um, there's five of them you want. There's um, quantum circuit, need a space just there. Uh, 
a classical register. So this is basically setting up the apparatus for doing circuits, the apparatus for doing um, classical bits along the bottom. Um, quantum register um, is the one for tracking your qubits. Um, executes for just running jobs. And the last one is a package um, that it needs in the background just for doing a not, um, results analysis. So you can port all those in. And so later on in the video, I might crop a couple of these little gaps out along the way. So if you see a few chops and changes in, in, in motion here, it's just me taking out minor delays while I'm waiting for things. So first thing we're going to do is set up our quantum register. So we're going to have a variable called Q that is basically quantum register. Um, 3Q. Like so. And so basically what we're doing is setting up a register that tracks three qubits through our program. Um, we're going to have, we're going to define an object circuit, which is a uh, quantum circuit um, that's connected to our register. And then um, what we're going to do is set up our circuit now, right? So the first thing we're going to do is add to our circuit a Hadamard gate that is on our quantum register for bit zero. Okay, so this will be um, circ dot h um, q zero like so. Okay, um, and I'm sort of assuming a little bit here. Everyone knows sort of the foundations of how to program in Python a little bit. If you don't know what this circ dot h means, um, I'll let you work that out um, for yourself separately. Um, there's some really nice um, online resources for teaching you how to learn at least the basics of um, Jupyter Notebooks. Um, okay, so the next is we're going to do a, we want a Hadamard on zero, then we wanted two control knots, right? And the first control knot links the zero line to the one line. So this is now going to be circ. Um, control knot is CX. Um, and then we've got to tell it which two lines we want to join together. So this is going to be um, quantum bit zero and quantum bit one, like so. Okay, so that's joining those two together. And then we wanted a second control knot between qubit zero and qubit two. So this is now going to be circ.cx um, q zero, oops, I've got the wrong brackets in here, uh, q zero, and Q2. Oops. And you can play for yourself around with reversing the order of those controlled knots and see what comes out as states and all sorts of things, right? This is this would be really nice in a computational physics course where you could actually really start to play with the idea of quantum mechanics and do real quantum mechanics experiments driving somebody else's um, experimental infrastructure. Okay, so that's sort of the beginnings of our circuit. And so if we want to have a look in here, what we can do is basically just draw our circuit. So what we're going to do is circ.draw. Um, and we need to tell it an output. And where output's going to be matplotlib so we can graph on the screen. So this is going to be output um, equals MPL in here. And what we should have is our nice little quantum circuit. So you can see here, qubit zero, qubit one, qubit two, Hadamard gate, controlled knot, controlled knot, exactly the things we just put in, okay? Um, now, what I'm gonna do at this point is um, hook up the classical part of this circuit, right? So now what we're gonna do is C equals um, classical register, I need some spaces in here. Classical register 3C, like so. And here I'm really just telling them to call them um, Q in the first instance, and these ones I'll be telling them to call them Cs. Um, so we can run that line. Um, and then we want to put measurement into this. And so what we can do is define uh, an operation called measure, which is quantum circuit 
um, Q and C. So what we're doing is saying, when we do a measurement, I want to measure all of the Qs across to the Cs. Um, and then you remember on the slide, we had a barrier between the inputs, input logic section and the measurement output section. So I'm going to put that measurement barrier in now at this point, um, just to decouple the two parts of the circuit. And so what I've got now is um, my quantum part of my circuit, my classical register running about it across the bottom. I've defined how I'm going to do a measurement. I've, after this set of circuits, uh, this piece of circuit I've got here, I've inserted my barrier. And then the next step in here is actually to put the measurement. Okay. And so my measurement is going to be uh, mes.measure um, Q and C. Um, that will give me that. And then basically the whole quantum circuit QC is going to be my um, first half of my circuit circ plus second half of my circuit mes, right? So I'm going to just find something called QC, which is basically circ plus mes. So two halves, um, like so. And then um, I can go in here and now I can draw my circuit again, just so that we can see the state of it now. So qc.draw um, output equals MPL. And now I've got my circuit, okay? So what I've got here is um, my original circuit. So this piece circ up here. I've got my measurement barrier just here, which just decouples um, the first part of my system from the last part of my system, essentially just makes sure that um, they run in a sequential fashion, that the, all the logic happens before all of the measurement happens. I've defined my um, classical register, which has got three bits in it. And then what I've done is said, I want to do a measurement of Qs across to my Cs. And so these are my three measures that then drop me down onto my classical register for getting my output. Okay, so this is the point where we pretty much just go and hook up the machines and let um, IBM's computer do the work for us. And so rather than type this as individual commands, I'll probably just cut and paste these just so that I don't get them wrong because they're slightly longer. So um, the first step in here, I'll still explain what they do as we go. So this one here, what we want to do is import from IBM Q the load account. Um, and um, the idea here is that I'm basically hooking up the API that I set up just before um, in the previous Jupyter Notebook to hook up this particular program to that same account. Okay, so um, we can run that. Um, that sometimes takes a few seconds to get a response, so let's wait for it to do it. Okay. Um, all of, some of those are just telling me that certain machines are not available at the moment, which is fine. Um, so let me find out what machines are available. I can go in here and get it to tell me what the available backends are. And when I mean backends, it's basically IBM will take jobs into um, a central um, position for um, the quantum computing site, and then it will farm it out to individual different quantum computers that they have on the network. And so those individual computers on the network are what they call the backends. Okay. So really, this is just provider backends. Um, I can run this. And it will tell us what machines are available for us at the moment. Okay, so there's a, there's a couple of simulators on here, which are not real quantum computers. They're actually simulators of quantum computers. And those basically exist so you can test your code before you go to the trouble of putting them onto an actual machine. Okay. Um, there are also a bunch in here of quantum computers, um, which have um, different sizes. They used to have the number of um, qubits available on them. You can see IBM Q16 Melbourne here is a 16 qubit machine. Some of the other ones, I'm not sure how big those are anymore. Um, I think a lot of the five qubit machines of old have been retired now. Um, so one thing that's actually really useful to do is to ask the server what the best backend to use is, because you're going to wait a little while while the job goes to the machine on a queue, the machine does it, and then it comes back and it can tell you which is the fastest way to do this. So we can take this little um, pack of code just here. Um, and all it really does is bring in a routine called least busy that you tell 
you send it to tell you um, to ask, I, ask IBM Q what the least busy of the large enough devices is. So in my program here at the moment, I will know that I need three qubits. Um, so any machine that's got less than three qubits, it's going to knock out. It's going to look at all the ones that got three or more qubits and, la and ask which is the least busy. Okay, so let's quickly run that. It should come report back to us um, what the least busy machine is in a second. And we can choose to run on that particular machine. Okay, it's Santiago. It was the same one I had last night. Um, okay, so now that our circuit's all ready to go, um, we can and we know which machine we want to run on, we can go in here and basically run our job. So um, what we're going to do here is pull in from Quisket um, a job monitor, basically tells us um, what's happening in a status line below this while we're waiting for it to keep going. Um, we're going to say how many shots to run the program, right? As you remember from earlier in your quantum mechanics course, you do one measurement and it's a probabilistic measurement. So if I take my 000111 state here and I do one measurement, I'm either going to get 000 or I'm going to get 111 or I could get some non-answer if I'm allowed, you know, experimental error in this thing. And um, that's not going to be very useful for me because I'm only going to have a single shot. So what I'm going to do is actually run this program 1,024 times and look at the statistics of those runs and hopefully they tell me something useful about the answer, okay? And what we would expect to see is equal probability between 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1 and not very much probability in all the others. Ideally zero, but if there's a little bit of error, they might be off a little bit, okay? Um, we're going to connect this max credits line in here is basically about how many of your credits for usage on the machine that you want to spend on doing this and you get a certain allowance in a certain period of time depending on you know who you are if you work for IBM you've probably got an infinite number of credits um, if you're a casual user you'll have some limited amount so that you don't end up hogging all the machines um, the next line in here is is our little ex, uh, execute module which just executes the program, gives it information on um, what the program is, which is QC. And QC is what we defined up here as circuit plus MES. Okay, so we've just defined the thing that we're going to send to them. The back end has been set by choosing the best back end. Okay, um, so we know we're going to run this on the least busy of them. If you want to run on a specific machine, you need to, need to send set back end to a specific machine. And then shots and max credits, as we explained. Job monitor will just tell us how this goes. So let's run it, and we might be waiting a little while. So if I get into a long point on the queue, I'll just clip out the video and we'll come back right when it's um, when we're last on the queue. Um, but while we're waiting for that, the job monitor should come up in a second. There it is. So the job gets validated at first. It's basically their machine checking that it's actually sensible and that it's going to run. And then it'll put us on a queue. Now we're 16 on a queue. It's not surprising we're in the middle of the day. Um, last night I was fifth on the queue. So I might take a little break here. And um, when I get down to like last on the queue, I'll come back and then we'll have a look at the results that we get back from the machine. So while we're waiting, you made all that money just on IBM, don't you? Nah, of course not. It's just one part in a bigger puzzle. You've got to realise that we now know everything there is to know about quantum computing, having seen how it plays out 100 years from now. That includes what works and what doesn't, and most importantly, when. Well, how does that help? Well, we can set some people up to win and reap the rewards, as you saw, but we also know who's going to fail and fail bad. We can short those suckers in the stock market and make some sweet, sweet doge on top. Wow, so who do you reckon's going down, Jono? A lot of them, but the most amusing? It's gonna be Microsoft. Microsoft? Yep, good old Microsoft. Look, they've done nothing since MS-DOS and Windows 95, right? Clippy, Zoom, Bing, all complete garbage. They even tried to tank the company with that all the executives on the stage dancing thing they did for the launch of Windows 95. Yet somehow, share price just keeps on rising. Huh. And? Well, we slipped them an envelope too. But this one? This one had a crazy idea we like to call marijuana fermions. Wait, you mean marijuana fermions? That particle that's its own antiparticle? 
the one invented by that Italian guy who vanished without a trace. Yeah, that guy. And we know nothing about his disappearance either, by the way, right? But, yeah, we sold him hard on this whole Majorana thing. Told him that they could make topologically protected qubits out of it. Told them that 2017 would be the year of topological braiding. That they're guaranteed to be on a rocket ship to quantum supremacy. <laughs> no way. Yeah, they put it hook, line and sinker. And the best bit, the experimental signature they're looking for, well, the types of devices they need to make can show something like that for a dozen other reasons. So working out what's real and what isn't, it's nearly impossible. The whole field, well, it's built on decades of single device results. Add some pressure to get outcomes. Prestigious journal, desperate for impact factor or two. Pinch of confirmation bias, the sort of mistake that students in third year lab get warned about. And Bob's your uncle. Someone's going to be taking a big fall. Wow, so radical, Jono. So you're short on Microsoft. Am I short? Is the Pope Catholic? I'm way short, Kev. I'm going to be the Michael Burry of quantum computing. I love heavy metal. Love playing the drums too. It's going to be so epic. Maybe I need to take some flying lessons. Learn to fly my new Gulfstream 6 around. Ideally somewhere scenic without too much traffic, it'd be great. One of the nice things about uh, learning to fly in Camden was that the queues for takeoff and landing were very short and there were no heavies. Um, we're now next on the queue, but uh, there were 16 jobs. Some of them are quite heavy and took a while. So um, that's been all of now 20, 25 minutes waiting for this, um, which is not so much fun if you're sitting in front of a machine watching the numbers tick down with a camera pointed at you, but um, it's okay if uh, you, know, you can go and take a coffee or have some lunch. So that's one option if you're gonna run during the day when it's quite busy. Um, running at night um, or at funny hours is actually a, another option. Um, you can also schedule jobs on this system if you do your programming right. So now you'll notice that the job is actively running. It should be a fairly quick job because we've only got three qubits and three logic gates in this, um, plus the measurement. And so now, sure enough, job's successfully run and we're ready to move on to the next step. So let's um, get in here and start looking at the results. So um, we need to define uh, a result from the experiment and we'll call that um, job exp dot result and so we're basically just parking the job result um, that we just did in um, in a variable okay and you'll notice the job exp we defined on the line before um, as the execution on the machine um, we're now going to um, just get statistical counts, right? Because we ran the experiment 1,024 times. So let's define something that's the number of counts, which is um, results exp dot get counts QC. So all these things um, in detail are in the documentation for Quiskit if you want to um, uh, look that up and learn it. Um, it's it's pretty quick to get, and I've just made an error in there. So what's my error? Um, oh, that should be result. Bosh bash done good. Um, then from type from correctly. Kiskit dot tools dot with two L's, not three, um, visualization with a Z because it's American spelling, import plot his, histogram. I probably could have imported this at the top just to get it out of the way, but uh, we'll do it down here. And then um, we're, we're now going to do define a number counts and our number counts um, Actually, we already have this. So let's do um, print count underscore exp. Okay, so here we now have the counts for our um, various states on the qubits, just written as numbers. So 21, 11, 8, 15, uh, 492. So this is one of the big results. 17, 
457, which is one of the other big results, and three. Okay, and you'll notice that the two big results are triple zero and triple one, as we would expect. So now we can just histogram these. So we've got like a, a visualization. So this would be plot underscore histogram. Um, and we want to plot. Um, oh, actually, we need we do need to define something in here. We need to define um, our x-axis. So this is going to be count. Um, equals result exp. Get counts QC. Okay, so now we can do our histogram. Plot histogram um, counts experimental versus counts. Um, which sets our x-axis. So now we can do this. What have I got wrong in here? Um, counts exp is not defined. Oh, it's because I call it count exp. Okay, um, so let's just correct this. Now it should work. Bingo. All right. <laughs> coding on the fly. Uh, so here we go, we've got a, plus, a histogram of our results now. So we've got 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, uh, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1, 1. And what you'll notice is that you get very high counts for 0, 0, 0, and 1, 1, 1, with nearly 50% probability. Okay, so if you've got an entangled state of 0, 0, 0, and 1, 1, 1, half the time you observe, they should all three, um, Alice, Bob, and Dwayne, should get uh, ones. Um, half of the time they should all get zeros and then the rest of the time they should all the other probabilities of outcomes should be zero and you'll notice in here there's a little bit of scattered error um, down in the bottom okay um, just to cross to the next slide um, just to convince you that this is really real um, here are some past results um, that I've done in uh, 2019 for this lecture, um, one running on the 16 qubit machine and run running on the five qubit, one of the older five qubit machines. And you can see that those different machines, which are separate to the one we ran now, Santiago, um, give you essentially the same result. You'll either get all zeros or all ones, as you would expect, and some error in the middle. And you'll notice on the older five qubit machine that there's a bit more error than you get on the 16 qubit machine in 2019. And there's even less error on this Santiago machine, which is just improving the error handling of your um, quantum computer systems as you go further along. Essentially, you're doing an experimental measurement, right? So sometimes you're going to get loss of coherence or something strange is going to happen in the result, and you're going to get results that are not consistent with what you're doing. And this is why when you do quantum computing, you need to do statistical approaches to this to get the measurements out. Okay. So um, on the slide, I've left you with the links for um, uh, instructions on how to set up Kiskit on your own machine. Um, instructions on how to run your own simulations. You'll also find really good instructions on the quantum computing IBM website. And um, there's a link to the uh, IBM quantum computing website there as well, both for instructions and for getting your um, API key. And um, with that, I think um, there's not a lot more to say. Um, you've now seen everything from the um, bits and logic end of quantum computation as a first look through to how to execute the operators, through to how you might build circuits, and then from the top end, you know, how to access a computer with a little bit of an operating system, how to run, how, how to write programs, how to run programs on that thing. There's a little bit of a gap in the middle here on, you know, how you actually take design circuits and turn them into experimental measurements that come back. There's a whole technology interface in there, which you can learn about in other courses. And uh, at this point, you've pretty much got a good look, good enough look to give you an entry point to quantum computing. And um, if you follow the pathway here, you can probably play around and write some of your own programs and have a little bit of fun with it. And I encourage you to do that. So um, this is the last lecture in the course. Thanks for all the people to all the people who've watched along the way. It's been 
fun teaching you, especially in my class. Um, I'll post my um, Jupyter Notebook for this um, on the course website for my students. So you've got um, the code and you can run it yourself and extend and play with it. And um, thanks for watching.